No greater love. The beauty of heaven placed right here. No greater love. And it's inside each and every one of us. Waiting to be experienced and waiting to be lived. So that is really what my whole idea of Lent this year is about. Loving that self. Instead of focusing on what we want to do away with or let go of, which those are things that are important too, but instead to spend this time of Lent, this time of preparation for Easter, loving the self. It's like what Annie was singing about. No greater love than that love that is placed within us as us. The divine self, the divine spark of the divine. That which we call the Christ within. And so my series this year during Lent is about falling in love and being in love and growing in love and living that love. How do we do that and what does that look like for us? And so last week, if you were here, some of you were here last week, you heard me talking about falling in love with that divine self. And how falling in love with that divine self can be, in some ways, uh, compared to falling in love with the, with the love of our life, our beloved in human form. I kind of drew a comparison last week of, between what it's like to fall in love with our beloved in human form and what it's like to fall in love with the divine self. And what an ecstatic and euphoric experience that can be for us. Both of those things can be for us. And that how when we fall in love, we feel that uh, euphoria sometimes and we, we lose sight of uh, some of the other things. And, you know, I talked about how we fall in love, we become deaf, dumb, and blind. You've heard about that, love is blind and love is deaf and love is dumb sometimes. And I explained that last week because falling in love, as research has shown, changes our brain. Things happen in our brain when we fall in love. And because the, the brain changes, the amygdala is, is suppressed and the, the frontal and prefrontal cortexes, are cortices, I guess is a plural for that, are suppressed. And so we don't reason as much, we don't think about as much, we don't try to plan as much. And so that's what happens when we fall in love. Um, and so that's a great place to be, isn't it? It's exciting to be in love. And my idea is how can we even, how can we live in the space of love all the time or as much as possible? I know it's not always, uh, always possible. Um, but what I've noticed in my own experience, and perhaps you've noticed it as well, is that once you fall in love with your beloved, you know, when you're, when you're in love, that everything he or she does is precious, right? <laughs> everything is endearing. Every little eccentricity you just think is so cute and so sweet and so endearing. But what I've noticed is that once the brain starts functioning again, <laughs> that some of those things change a little bit. That the things that at one point you found so endearing and sweet and, and precious sometimes can become annoying and irritating <laughs> when the brain begins to get re-stimulated. Now, for those of you who are freshly in love, please uh, don't... Uh, I'm not trying to dissuade you at all, but um, I've just noticed that it sometimes happens that way. Um, and so, you know, we, we begin to then question 
What happens with that, I think, for us when we fall in love or when we, we meet the person that we know that is our love and we fall in love and we enjoy that space of being in love and then we begin to then look at them maybe from a different perspective and we see, begin to see them from a different perspective. And all of a sudden one day you wake up and you say, who are you? I might be telling on myself, I'm not sure, but... So we begin to then, that's a point in our relationships, in the human form. I think when we begin to question, is this the relationship I want to be in? You know, psychologists tell us that we attract ourselves and we are attracted to people who reflect back to us areas of our own lives where we're not loving ourselves or areas of our lives that we need to love ourselves, and that sometimes we're looking for the parent or or, uh, somebody to give us something that we were missing. And so sometimes in our human experience, we attract ourselves to people who are going to be our greatest teachers. Have you experienced that? That your love is sometimes your greatest teacher. Sometimes bringing up for you areas of your life in which you're not really completely loving yourself. And we begin to project that onto the other person. That's at least, I think, what what traditional psychology would say to us. And so we sometimes begin to, as we come to that place in our relationships, we begin to question, is this really what I want to do? Do I really want to learn? And so that's the point in our, our relationships when we sometimes leave the relationship. Or at some point, you know, we may decide that we want to invest in this relationship. And uh, what, <laughs> what I am drawing in, in uh, comparison is that sometimes the same thing happens when we meet our true self. You might not think that that's true, but my experience of that has been that when I, am, when I truly commit to being in that place of love, when I can truly commit to getting to know and and spending time with and really committing to my divine self that what happens sometimes is that that ego structure gets activated. What I mean by the ego structure is all those myths and messages and beliefs that we hold about ourselves, how we have been operating in the world, how we see ourselves in human form and how we how we know ourselves in relationship to other people, how we know ourselves in relationship to our activities, our work, or our finances, or whatever it is that how we know ourselves. It's sort of what, what, what I call the ego structure and that we allow to define us, and that becomes sort of our box, our comfort zone in which we operate. Because it, it is some, in some ways security. We know. You know, I know how I'm supposed to be in this particular situation. I know how I'm supposed to be in this relationship or in this job, and it becomes comfortable for us. And so when we begin to explore something different, it may not be quite so comfortable. And it's sometimes a challenge for us to really break free from that ego structure because sometimes that ego structure can become a prison in which we we imprison ourselves. And even though it may be comfortable, it is not in alignment with our that love, that divine self, that Christ self that wants to express the soul of us, if you will. And so when we begin to, it's like, um, it's sort of like, you know, we, we talk about everything vibrating, everything is energy, everything has a frequency, everything is resonating. And if you think about the soul of you resonating at a particular frequency, and then the ego of yourself ec- uh, resonating at another frequency, when you begin to activate and strengthen the frequency through your intention of your divine self, then you feel the dissonance of the frequency that you've been operating at. Does that make sense? 
And the stronger that frequency gets in your own awareness, the more uncomfortable it gets trying to operate from that ego perspective. And it's not always pleasant. I'm not trying to dissuade you. I just think that's what happens. And we talk about this ego structure, the ego sometimes in some traditions we talk about, well, that just has to die or fall away. And I don't really like the image of dying because I don't believe anything really dies. I think that things transform. And I think it's about transforming that ego structure. And so I think that what I I would like to suggest is that when we focus on the awareness of our divine self, when we spend time in prayer and meditation and contemplation and filling our awareness with the divine self, then we strengthen that frequency. And then that frequency can then transform something different the things that are not in alignment with it, begins to become, come in resonance with it. Make sense? But it's not always fun. Have you noticed in your relationship with your beloved that it's not always fun? That sometimes there's some struggle. Sometimes there's some dissonance. You don't always agree. But are you willing to work through that? Are you willing to face that? Are you willing to find a place where you can come into some agreement and resonance with that? And so that's what I'm suggesting that we we do about our divine self and coming into loving that self. Because I think it does require some transformation. And transformation is sometimes messy. And sometimes not always pleasant. Again, I'm not trying to dissuade you. I'm just uh, thinking about being realistic. At least I'm sharing what my experience has been around that. It's sort of like the uh, transformation of a caterpillar to a butterfly. That the... There's a story, uh, you may be familiar with this little story called Hope for the Flowers. How many of you know the story, Hope for the Flowers? It's a story about caterpillar, two caterpillars, one named Stripe and one named Yellow. And Stripe is a male caterpillar and Yellow is a female caterpillar. And uh, they are struggling uh, to find. It's like, sort of like we, our lives, you know, it represents how we struggle to get to the top. There's this pile of of caterpillars and they're all crawling to try to get to the top. And they create this pillar of caterpillars up to wherever. And then Stripe and Yellow are struggling to get to the top. And eventually they find out that there's nothing at the top. And so they decide to come back down. But they know deep within them That there is something more. That all the struggling, all the trying, all the efforting in life to try to get somewhere is not what it was about for them. But they knew there was something within them that knew there was more. And so Stripe takes off and he goes back up to try to do it again. Well, maybe I did it wrong. Maybe I went the wrong way. So he tries to do it again. Struggling in a different way to get to the top, to find out what's up there. And Yellow decides to stay behind. And one day she is traveling along and she sees this this, uh, other caterpillar up on a branch. And he's spinning this web around him. And um, she says, what are you doing? Why are you doing that? He explains to her that in order to become a caterpillar, you must do this. And you must be inside this. And she says, well, does that mean I have to die in order to become this butterfly? He said, yes and no. You don't have to die, but what you are has to be transformed into what you will be. What you are here to be. And so she follows him and she does that and she eventually becomes this beautiful butterfly. 
And she flies off to find Stripe and to tell him, although she can't talk, she tries to tell him about the story, and he gets it. But he struggles with it. Can I really be a butterfly? Is that really what I am? Does it hurt? Is it painful to become a butterfly? Do I have to die to become a butterfly? And she convinces him how to do it, and he does it. But I think that, and then they fly off together, (laughs) happily ever after. (laughs) But I think it mirrors for us what happens within us. That we know that Christ Self within us, the soul within us knows that there's more. No matter how much we struggle out here, it's not out here. No matter how much we try to define ourselves through our ego structure, no matter how much we try to strengthen that aspect of ourselves, it's not enough. It is not who we are. And sometimes we say, well, it sounds like it might be too painful or it might take too long or it might be too arduous for me to to really live my true nature, for me to become that beautiful butterfly, that beautiful light. So I think I'll just stay a caterpillar. I know what this is like. I know what it's like down here on the ground. I know what I'm supposed to eat. I know how to do this. I don't know what that's about. So I think I'll just stay down here. But what I want to say to us today is that I think that we know. And I think you know. That you are a butterfly. That you are that Christ nature. That divine self. That is urging you forward to be expressed in the world. To claim your true nature. To expand and to be that true nature and to share that nature with the world. I think that many of us sometimes feel what a a minister of mine used to call divine discontent. Because we know there's more. We know there's more. And that more requires us to be transformed. Transformed. Now, if you know anything about the transformation of the caterpillar to the butterfly, the caterpillar basically does dissolve in the cocoon. But there are the essence of the butterfly is always there, even in the goo. You know, I love it when somebody said, There's God, God is in the goo. You know, God is in the goo. God is in the goo of the caterpillar, and God is in the goo of your life. Even if it feels like there can't, God can't possibly be there, God is in the goo of your life. Even if it feels like your life is falling apart, God is in the goo. God is the goo. God is the goo as you. <laughs> as Dr. Zeus might say, I don't know. God is the goo as you. I like that. God is the goo as you. I mean. Sounds like a good song, maybe a good story. I don't know. God is the good as you. Um, But there is that within you that knows, that lives, and that is inspiring you forward, I believe, to be all that you can be, to be that beautiful light that shines in the world. And I think that in order to do that, it requires us to do some work. And some of that work is, is, I mean, all the work really is internal. Some of it is, is about meditation and, and prayer and contemplation and strengthening ourselves, strengthening our awareness. But as I was thinking through this this week and how I was thinking about growing in that capacity of love, growing in love for ourselves, that it's important for us to claim for ourselves our own divine power to transform, and to transcend. As we see in the story of the caterpillar transcending that uh, space of the earth that 
crawling around and then being transformed and then really ascending. It's sort of the whole story of Easter in a way. And so as we prepare ourselves for that, I want to suggest this week that we focus on a few of what Charles Fillmore, the co-founder of Unity, defined as our 12 powers. Now, the 12 powers, uh, for many of you, if, you don't, if you're not aware of the 12 powers, the 12 powers of man, Charles Fillmore discerned uh, with the help of some of the uh, earlier traditions and probably some of the Eastern traditions as well. They're very much similar to the chakra system that many uh, other traditions talk about. But the things I want, us to, I want to suggest that we focus on this week. Uh, first is the power of understanding. And Charles Fillmore uh, placed the power of understanding in what some traditions talk about as the third eye, right in the brow area. And he talked about it as having a gold uh, color. And the power of understanding is our power to see clearly. To see what is the truth and to know the truth, to understand. And so I would invite us this week in our time of contemplation and meditation to focus on that space. To focus on your power of understanding, your third eye right there, and to focus on that, you may even want to see it as a gold color and see it expanding so that you see clearly beyond the ego structure, beyond the comfort zone, beyond the prison walls that sometimes the ego creates for us, to see beyond that to the truth of your divine self. Like that little caterpillar saw the truth of himself and herself as this beautiful butterfly. That is who you are. It takes our willingness and our ability and our capacity to see it. And so I invite us to focus there. Understanding, third eye, gold. Also it takes our, using our power of faith, which is located in the center of the head, according to Charles Fillmore, and its color is blue. Paul said in his uh, letter to Hebrew, the Hebrews is that faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. Faith is our power to hold our knowing that even though I cannot see the way, even though I don't know how, I'm going to get from the caterpillar to a butterfly. I exercise my power of faith and I hold faith knowing that it is so, knowing that it is true, knowing that with my power of understanding, I see the truth of me. I see beyond the ego structure and with my power of faith, I hold that it will happen as I allow it to happen and as I focus on it happening beyond the limitation of what might appear in the physical. Power of faith is blue in the center of your your head. Focus on understanding and faith. And then I believe it's important for us to focus on our power of strength, which Charles Fillmore said is in the lower back, or in the loins, sort of, if you will. It's that power of strength, which which is green, And to hold to that power of strength, because the power of strength is our power of perseverance. That even in the goo, we can use our strength, our power of strength, to move through. To hold the power, to know the truth. To keep the power of faith strong, to know beyond a shadow of a doubt that this is my true nature, and then to use our power of strength to make it through those times when it seems to be impossible. And combined with all that, to strengthen, activate our power of love in the heart. Because it is love that informs all of that. Love is that center in the heart that we see as pink. 
You see in our tables out here, everything is pink this month. In some calendars, pink. Uh, February is the month of, pink, uh, from the month of love, and in some calendars, it's the month of strength. So again, as you're moving, as you're growing in your love, as you're moving beyond this idea that I'm only human and that I'm comfortable where I am, Connect with that place within the divine self that is always moving you to something greater. To that divine self that is your truth, that represented by that butterfly. And it takes our willingness to commit to that. Activate those powers, understanding and faith and strength and love to see you through and to know yourself as that divine presence. That is truly who you are. That is truly who you are here to be in whatever beautiful way that unfolds for you. Not all caterpillars look alike. But all of them are here to share their love, to share their beauty, And to give as the divine presence and form, and so are you. So as you grow in love, know that it is not always easy, but you have the power, you are the power to do it and to transform into this beautiful creature that you truly are.